Morning YouTube, Sunday morning, time for the Outsiders and first dog on the moon. Time now for Outsiders, I'm Barry Cassidy and you're not. And they are this morning, Chris Berg from the IPA, Nick Fike, editor of the Monthly and the nemesis of Joe Hockey, Wendy Harmer, editor of the Hoopla. Wendy, you've upset the treasurer. I have, I have. It's one of those things where you... It was bizarre, actually. I sort of tweeted, then went downstairs, had a bath, watched a bit of footy, came back up, had a look at Twitter, and it, my, my, my phone had exploded, basically. Well, you, you were rather naughty. You said that people will be killing themselves in, the car, in cars as a result of the federal budget. I did suggest that homelessness, that's what I was on about, <laughs> homelessness will rise, and uh, that's what I said when Joe Hockey's budget bites, and he called me, what was it, shameful, <laughs> offensive, and without class. Okay. So it's a very, it's a really well, odd I've always, thing. I've always said this about the treasurer, he's a fine judge of character. <laughs> oh, thank you. But it is a really weird, I don't, I was thinking about it this morning, I don't, I don't think I really use the insult about, uh, um, you have no class. It's not something that I, that I actually say. So it's odd, it's an odd one. Now, now Chris Berg, you, you confided um, before we went on here this morning that you have occupied yourself in these last few hours with reading Mr. Hockey's book. I have. I have. I have read uh, Joe Hockey's... It's not an autobiography. Um, uh, everybody has to be very careful to point out because we keep <laughs> saying, well, this is what Joe Hockey wants us to think and so forth. But it is a biography written by a third independent person. A journalist to boot. A journalist to boot. It is an incredibly flattering book. That's the one overwhelming feeling that I got from finishing it up. A hockeyography. Um, a hockeyography. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it, is um, uh, it, it is very positive about Joe Hockey and Joe Hockey's achievements. Um, well, what's the vibe you get from it though? I mean, the, 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 the Everything is fantastic. Everything is absolutely fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is for the best to the best of all possible economies. <laughs> yes, in, indeed, indeed. Um, look, it's, 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 a, it, it, it's something about the timing of it, though, isn't it? Everyone's mm. talking about the timing. But you can imagine in, in Joe Hockey's mind, it'll be, I'll be sitting back, the budget will have gone through all my measures, and it, I'll be borne aloft by the Australian public, and then my book will come out. Well, I'm not really sure. Go to I'm, plan. Not sure. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that's the case, because... Um, it, when you're presented with an opportunity like that, so a journalist comes up to you and says, I'm going to write a biography of you, Mr. Hockey, mm -hmm. um, should you refuse to cooperate or should you at least give them a couple of interviews really, that you might really, spin it in your direction? It's a really yeah. tricky call. I mean, and Nick, the, the point that, uh, that, that Wendy makes there too about you know, the lead times in these things are, are, are quite extreme. Yeah. And, and the position, you know, this was clearly a decision made in, in the great euphoria uh, post-election, and these things can come back to nip you. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, Pat, one could never have known, but I think Laura Tingle said that its most devastating feature was a, a sense of smugness or a self-congratulatory uh, mm. uh, sort of sense about it. And I think it was, it's always, I mean... It happened before he'd even delivered his first budget. I, I do, I wonder what on earth they were thinking. It's, it seems that, um, it seems that you should never put yourself in a situation where you've just come into, the, into power and you're already presenting yourself as the next in line and you are giving access to journalists where, and you're, you're telling your, your closest friends and advisors to speak to journalists and, and they're saying, you know, the Treasurer will never trust the Communications Minister ever again. As in, the Treasurer of the country doesn't trust the person who's in charge of the biggest infrastructure project that the country has ever been, has but, ever had. But, 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 but I think, I, uh, uh, a lot of people have made that argument, but I think it's actually quite unfair to Joe Hockey at the moment, because again, he didn't actually write the book, and a lot of as the expert in this conversation on hockeyography, the one who's read it, <laughs> um, the whole thing is incredibly self-congratulatory. It's the spin that the author, Madonna King, put on the book, and probably put on the book because when you write these books before they've come become prime minister, you want to at least give the kick on along that they might become prime minister again. One of my um, one of the books in the bookshelf that I have, of course, is the biography of John Hewson, which of course is also a very self-congratulatory and positive book, and didn't really go anywhere. So, 
I don't think it's quite fair to say, well, Joe Hockey gave us this image of himself at this stage, even if it was written six months ago, this must have been but I have to say, the events have already proven that large chunks of this book are wrong. As in, it says that he's a blue chip salesman. He, he's done the worst job of any treasurer <laughs> ever of selling his budget. So I, I have to say I'm a little bit sceptical about and, and this is the book. subtext, isn't it, Wendy, that, and this goes to your conversation with the treasurer in recent times, that the, the budget is such a... I guess we could flatter it by calling it a work in progress. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, goodness knows what's going to happen. We're in this hiatus, of course, because of uh, M17, and so, you know, the mm. partisan politics, everyone's backed off from that, and, you know, the, the, uh, the parliament is in recess. But there are some massive baseball bats waiting for Joe Hockey in this budget, aren't there, when everyone gets back to work and, uh, you know, and uh, starts talking about uh, the... Doll changes and uh, and 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 the rest. I mean, I, 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 yes, I think he's doing a very poor job of selling it, and people are still angry. And how long is it since the budget came out? And the concern about the budget, Chris, is is there's all that pain for what's fairly marginal gain. I mean, and, and he, I mean, he, here's the interesting comparison that we had last week. Much again, self congratulation about the removal of the carbon tax. A thing which might have injected one point whatever it is billion dollars into the federal coffers in this this coming year had it remained. And on the other side of that narrative, we have a government telling us we, they need every cent that they can get, so much so that they'll take it out of the unemployed and the pensioners. This has been the problem from the budget, um, or with the budget from the start, that there are a bunch of mixed messages. So one one of the most obvious mixed messages is the GP co-payment, um, which raises money for the government, but the government has also turned around and said, well, it's going to put most of that money into a um, health investment fund. Um, so, you know, what is it? Is it to fix, is it to fix a unsustainable healthcare system, or is it a way to fund a new giant research project? So the, these sort of problems are uh, magnified throughout the budget. Some of the most controversial measures, like the, um, uh, the six-month six quarantine for people on New start under the age of 30. That doesn't really raise very much money. That doesn't or doesn't save very much money, I should say. And it doesn't help when you're in New Zealand <laughs> telling it, you know, that everyone that the economy is going just fine. You know, there is yes, no budget that emergency. An I mean, interesting that's quote crazy. from last week. Mr. Hockey, of course, uh, is well justified and is uh, he comes to his own defence. Well, the bottom line is, every treasurer, as you would expect, uh, would prosecute the case for greater savings or every treasurer worth their salt. Uh, the problem was underlay that they didn't do it and they just increased taxes and addressed the other savings. I just encourage my Senate colleagues uh, to have a good look at the reason why we're doing what we're doing. We're doing it for the country. Uh, it's not a case of selling the budget or uh, selling individual policies. It is about laying down the best policy. And I guess the question, Nick, and, and this was one that will, will exercise the minds of various senators, uh, apart from anyone else, is whether it is in fact the best policy and you know, w whether the, the aspirations that the government has for its budget are in fact matched by the, the reality of what it might achieve. I always go back to this, this speech that he famously gave about the, that Ho Hockey famously gave about the age of entitlement and that the, the age of entitlement is over. Well, the only people that haven't been hit by this budget are the entitled. The only people in, in, uh, across, in terms of, uh, in class terms or in terms of wealth terms, the people who are, who are quite well off are the least hit. As in, why is a single mother being hit by many more thousands of dollars per year compared to, to rich North Shore bankers? I, I, it's, um, it's something that uh, has never been explained. Yes. I mean, this sense of entitlement, uh, it, it's, he, has a, he has an odd view of entitlement. This is the thing that's going to play out domestically. I mean, and I guess that, look, the big story of, of last week was how domestic events were, were wiped from the public consciousness. There were rumours that a deal was possible on Friday as the US Secretary of State John Kerry stayed in Cairo for talks on a ceasefire. It's believed a plan was presented to both sides, but Israel's cabinet met and rejected the proposed truce. This after 18 days of conflict in Gaza and the deaths of 800 Palestinians and more than 30 Israelis. The war threatens to erupt into a broader uprising. Protests continued in the West Bank overnight 
five Palestinians were killed. And more talk of ceasefires in, in the past 24 hours. I Israel wanting to keep, uh, keep peace for the moment. Hamas apparently rejecting that offer, the death toll nudging a thousand. The death toll in Syria nearby, as we've been reminded in the weekend papers, nudging 1,700. And on top of that, in the past week, we have MH17. It's been hard, Chris, to avoid these conversations about the relativities of these events, of the, the outpouring that we've seen around the deaths of the Australians and the aircraft as against the sort of unfolding and it would seem unstaunchable tragedy in, in Gaza. Yeah, yeah, difficult I things. It, it, in, incredibly. And um, if you step back, I suspect one of the reasons that we get... Uh, all, all human deaths are equally tragic and, and we all know that, everybody everybody understands that but obviously we in a western country feel deaths more well, some deaths more powerfully than other deaths um, depending on our backgrounds and depending on all those sorts of things mm -hmm. and I suspect that one of the things that really hit people about the MH17 tragedy was um, nobody expects a um, plane flying across between two first world countries to, um, to, to get shot down um, and tragically, we do have a basic expectation in the first world, in a safe country, that um, there are some terrible places in the world where, where these tragedies are tragically routine. And so I think, I think that that helps explain, it, it, it doesn't excuse or anything like that, but that explains at least part of our, 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 our distinct attitude to these things. And Wendy, the, the Prime Minister's performance through this has been much remarked upon in this past week. Has he impressed you too with his, his sort of gravity, his sense of this occasion? I think he's, it's obvious that he has um, been affected by it and um, that he's um, taken a, a strong leadership role here. Uh, it, Tim Dunlop wrote a really fantastic piece in the King's Tribune about this, about uh, this time when the whole nation is in mourning and we... Uh, the role of, I guess, of our Prime Minister, whether he's a, the chief mourner or whether, uh, you know, that should be left to the Governor-General, that our mourning as a nation inevitably comes through political structures. And so it's, it's very difficult to deal with, and there is a temptation... <coughs> I guess, uh, from, uh, from uh, people in politics to use this occasion. But it's so tricky not to sort of overstep the mark. It's a very interesting time. But I've got to say, um, I think most of our leaders in times of national tragedy um, have, uh, they step up to the mark. I mean, don't you think? Is there oh, anyone absolutely. you can, you look back, can you say that anyone hasn't, you know, hasn't, done a good and competent job, but it doesn't actually go on to save them from political annihilation. Well, and, 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 and this, I think, uh, Nick, is an interesting thing, too, that uh, and, and we were talking before about there's a news poll in the field um, from, from this weekend, which we'll report next week, and we will expect that to show an improvement in Mr Abbott's stocks. It, con it confounds me that, that they, they see the effect of that sort of genuineness in a moment like this, and yet revert to type as politicians. I think I think these sorts of incidents it's interesting that people turn to polit like Wendy said, that people turn to politicians and and it's it's, it's sort of all we've got, isn't it? It is. I guess it's a it's a touching sort of sign of faith in the political system. It's also there's a sign of faith in the media and the media reasserts its power to to present the narrative that makes us all feel a particular way. I think these are really interesting times. I think they show that there is a base level like a respect or conservatism in in the Australian population with regards to, to national issues of, of you know, mourning and it is interesting because the role of the Governor General um, is, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, that should probably be the person, I guess, that takes on that role of Chief Mourner. Someone a little uh, apart from the political process. Yes, that's right. And I, and I was remembering very much, you remember when the canyoning accident happened mm. and Bill Dean was there and the sprigs of waffle? for those 14 young Australians who were killed. That was a terribly moving and effective uh, uh, you know, ceremony, I thought. And a, a little bit more of that, I think, rather than, 
going for the military, I think that that's, that's what, what, because the military aspect that Tony Abbott sort of naturally goes for, it doesn't really appeal to well, as many Australians as he may think. I mean, it, it took him all week to reduce this situation to a three-word slogan, but we got there in the end with Operation Bring Them Home, and, and that, I mean, well, I think, Chris, that, that rang a little oddly. I'm not convinced that we do turn to our leaders for this sort of moral, uh, for, to politicians who we all respect as, uh, as politicians per se. I don't think we do turn to them for moral leadership. I don't think that that's something that we do. What we do ask them to do is the things that are within their power to do. We don't have the capacity as a community to turn around and um, send police to, uh, uh, to the Ukraine, but the Prime Minister of Australia does, and we don't have the capacity to uh, push international action in the UN, but the Foreign Minister does have that capacity. I suspect what we're doing is conflating our moral desires to, um, to, to, to emotionally engage with an issue and our desire to have political leaders do practical things on our behalf, and I think hey, on the hey, latter, hey. Tony Abbott has, has done precisely what um, it has been widely desired. Whether he is enough of a um, mourner in chief for you, I don't. I don't think we should be. I don't think we should be looking to the government for That's mourner in chief. That doesn't make any sense to me. It's pretty really unseemly, too, isn't it? I mean, to be, you, you know, you've got the victims of this tragedy here, and here we are all speculating as, oh, I wonder if it's, he's going to do him good in the polls. I mean, there's something really. But I don't think he's icky. thinking. I don't think he's thinking that. No, no, either. I don't think he's thinking that. And, at and I don't. And I, I don't think you could look at Tony Abbott's. Um, hmm. Uh, uh, work over the last week and say he's trying to emotionally place himself in the centre of this situation. I don't think that's the case. No, I no, I don't. I'm not saying he's. I'm saying that others are. You know, there is, there is. You, you, well, I mean, there's a lot of commentators who, who've written, a lot of journalists who said this is the, this is the moment. But, I this mean, is where a lot of commentators have to commentate. That's, that's <laughs> what yeah, happens. That's a rule of nature. Abbott <laughs> <laughs> has given more press conferences in the past week <clears throat> regarding this issue than he has on almost any other issue. Yes. So I, I don't think he's... It's uh, th there's, an awkward, there's an awkward tipping point in these things when perhaps mm. the, the mourner role starts to retreat and the politician reasserts, but uh, for the moment... Well, it's I been in our we, interest. Uh, we, we'll we'll have to, we have to cut that off. I'm sorry, Wendy. <laughs> no, um, right. But that has been outsiders and we're, we're starved for time. Oh, OK. Uh, it was lovely to be here. This morning, they've been Chris Berg for the IPA. Wendy Harmer, used to editor of the Hoopla. And Nick Fike, editor of The Monthly, eight minutes away from ten. Because 
There's, there's lots of hummus here. It's delicious. It's, uh, it's the best hummus south of Coburg. Hang on, hang on. Let me check that. Would you mind if I pop you on hold for a moment? No, no, that's OK. until you blow up my kebab shop on Sydney Road in Brunswick, Australia. If that is in Gaza, yes. Mate, mate, do you reckon you might have the wrong number? I mean, this is ridiculous. <coughs> Who are you people? Don't get belligerent with me, Barry. If that's even your real name, that's how you got in this pickle in the first place. I'm not the one sheltering terrorists. You should have thought of that before you stashed all those homemade rockets in your bathtub. Seriously, though, what am I supposed to do? I've got ten minutes, I mean, well, no, six minutes, to get my family, my cat, the possessions, and what, run into the street? Where am I supposed to go? Well, obviously, the sensible place to go is wherever we aren't dropping bombs on everyone. There's nowhere coming up on my map at the moment, but if you go and check our website later, you should be able to find a few spots. Or you could download the app. It's all there on the app. Exits out of Gaza, none currently open at the moment. It's got bomb shelters, none showing at the moment. But Hamas will insist on building all those tunnels, but no bomb shelters? Not a single one. What's that about? But you're holding an entire people, including children, responsible for the behaviour of its military and blowing them up. My children and I, we haven't actually done anything. Yeah, but you've only got yourselves to blame. You should have lived somewhere other than the world's largest open-air prison. Anyway, we're just defending ourselves. Uh, four minutes. You cannot be serious. This has to be a joke. You don't even sound Israeli. And you don't sound very Palestinian. Well, it's because I'm not. I told you, I'm in Brunswick. Well, then you've got nothing to worry about. Anyway, I've got to go. There's a lot of other people to call. Uh, but... Uh, oh, there's one last thing. Yes? After this part of the call is completed, we'd really appreciate it if you could stay on the line, please, and take our brief survey. Thank you for your time, and have a really great day. <coughs> up to 10 o'clock. That's it from Dog, another guide to modern living. Well, yeah, that's just about summing it up. Of course, there are a couple of <coughs> historical footnotes there. Um, I'm pretty sure there was an outfit called the Royal Air Force Bomber Command, and I'm absolutely certain they decided that the best way they could contribute to the Allied war effort was to strategically carpet bomb German dormitory suburbs in the aim of de-housing the workers and breaking the German morale. So they developed special bombing techniques to create firestorms in wooden cities, change the weather, cook 48,000 people in one night at Hamburg, 138,000 at Dresden. Um, so it is, in the view of the Israeli political and military classes, entirely legitimate to punish an entire people right down to the babies in nappies for whatever their military have been doing, right? That's one historical footnote. If you believe that might is right, if you believe that you have a God-given right to selfish defence, i.e. kill anybody you think you're frightened of because you're frightened of them because they look scary, then, yep, it's perfectly reasonable for the Israeli Zionist government to be artillery attacking and otherwise pulverising 800 to 1,000 civilians. That's just the way it goes if you believe in warriors. A bit rough on the people who live next door to the warriors and don't actually support them or subscribe to them, but I guess they're either supposed to run away or put an awful lot of faith in their God theory and maybe, maybe there's no positive outcomes available to them and it's time their God theory took them off the playing board as painlessly as possible. Sort of uh, <coughs> to underline the cliche that only the good die young, maybe they do.
maybe the people who've done their best with what they've got available get to be somebody else's innocent victim so that the bad guys can have a learning experience. Don't really know on that one. I'll take it on faith. The other historical footnote is this business of Wendy Harmer getting uh, Joe Hockey upset because Wendy Harmer said that when Joe Hockey's budget began to bite, people would be killing themselves in their cars. Well, guess what? Friday morning's news was that a 27-year-old and a 23-year-old and their dog were found dead in a car parked... Oh, I forget the name of the road, but and it was outside Bathurst, I think it was. And Australia's welfare support groups came out very hard and strong saying that yes the National News and Weather Service have been describing how cold the weather is and uh, it always hits the homeless worst and these people were thought to have been living in their car and relying on a butane heater to keep themselves warm and they didn't leave a window open probably trying to economise on the cost of butane by not letting the hot air out as they saw it and they gassed themselves. Um, last I heard the police were not regarding it as suspicious but I would like to see somebody take out a civil suit against Joe Hockey. For malfeasance. For being in receipt of a salary as Federal Treasurer and instead of coming up with a budget that will benefit all of the nation, he's come up with a budget that will persecute the least well off. And now, as Wendy Harmer suggested, Australians are starting to kill themselves in their cars. This pair weren't killing themselves because they were depressed, they were killing themselves because they didn't understand the consequences of operating a combustion heater in a closed space. And of course, as they said, Tony Abbott swan around the world trying to declare war on Ukrainistan, despite the fact that Ukrainistan, and I call it Ukrainistan because admittedly it's not predominantly Muslim like Kazakhstan and Pakistan and Uzbekistan and Afghanistan and all the other stands, but in common with all the other stands, Ukrainistan is a place with a border with Mother Russia where the natives like to be revolting. They'd like to be revolting so that they can become more Russian or less Russian. But they're never quite happy with how Russian dominated they are. They always want more or less. And as far as I'm concerned, Ukrainistan, Uzbekistan, Belarusistan, Balkanistan, Macedoniastan, Serbiastan, they're all stands. It's a completely uninformed, parochial, post-colonial eccentric viewpoint, but it kind of works for me, you know. All those countries that ring Russia, they're the stands. They might not have stand in their name, but it doesn't stop me from using it that way. A quirk, a linguistic eccentricity perhaps. <clears throat> but, yeah. Moral of the story, take a staycation. Don't get on an airliner unless you can kick the tyre, inspect the control surfaces, wobble the wingtips and make a lot of other structural checks. You have no guarantee that it's going to come down safely or where it's going to fly over. You get on that airliner and you hope that the people who are charging apparently $45 to fly from Sydney to Brisbane. $45. I, I just don't understand how you can operate jet aircraft at the prices that the public have been trained to demand. It's just not, not reasonable. Um, but that's my views on the week. We have... Uh, a Prime Minister and a Foreign Minister who are jet-setting around the world basically trying to look like the toughest pro-American, pro-NATO
lap dog that the Americans have on their, their handful of leashes. Australia, for some reason, is making all the running. You don't see the Dutch Prime Minister running around having a, a face-off bluff competition with Putin, do you? But on the other hand, he doesn't need to. Holland's biggest trading partner is Russia. He's got a lot of actual economic clout. Tony Abbott, I don't think he's got any clout. I think Russia's already decided they don't want any more kangaroo meat. It's all very interesting, but not hopeful. The Middle East is continuing to erupt or fulminate fester. I don't see the Americans backing down. And of course, the government in Kiev has imploded. Their Prime Minister's resigned. The best analysis I've heard of that one comes from 55 Ella 2007K, who says it's because the people who decided that they wanted to be close to NATO so they could get all sorts of marvellous trade benefits have now discovered that the consequences of their policy are going to be to completely bankrupt the nation and they're resigning rather than be in the driver's seat when the shit hits the fan. So Tony Abbott and Bronwyn Bishop are making all these deals with the government in Kiev which has just imploded about how it's going to be okay for 190 Australian federal cops and military to go in and guard the crash site while somebody else is supposed to look for the missing mobile phones and crotchless lace knickers and whatever else was in the baggage. Um, and, and of course the, the now non-existent imploded government in Kiev doesn't actually control the country where the debris field is. It's the ragtag rebels in Ukrainistan who control that. Yeah. Sounds great, surely. What could be um, better than that? Hey, eh? what do you think, Eric? Hey? What do you think? You think it's time for me to feed you up close, don't you? Okay. Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Come on, mate. Yes, it's good, isn't it? I particularly like the kookaburra serenade. better at being an Australian than Tony Abbott is, aren't you? Yes. Yes. Just get better lighting if I hold the camera over here, you see. Yes. And I think that's probably enough. Yes. It was very clever of you to wait for the kangaroos to leave.
Chill.